This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com and by The New Press, which has loads of great titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Empire of Resentment, Populism's Toxic Embrace of Nationalism by Lawrence Rosenthal. In Empire of Resentment, Lawrence Rosenthal examines the far right's ideological shift from the free market ethos of the Tea Party to Donald Trump's anti-immigrant America First nationalism. Rosenthal suggests that right-wing populism is a protean force whose prime mover is the resentment felt towards perceived cultural elites, and whose abiding feature is its ideological flexibility, which now takes the form of xenophobic nationalism. Rosenthal locates Trumpism in the illiberal international zeitgeist and warns anti-government and white nationalist sentiment will continue after Trump. The future of democratic politics in the United States and abroad depends on whether the left has the political capacity to mobilize with a progressive agenda of its own. Empire of Resentment Populism's Toxic Embrace of Nationalism by Lawrence Rosenthal. Out now from the New Press. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. There is no single or full explanation for the Bernie inauguration meme's success. But I'll take a shot. For many across the country, well beyond the left, the photograph of the bemittened socialist grandfather curmudgeon resonated so powerfully not only because the pose was funny and endearing, but because, of course, it was a photo of Bernie striking that pose. People like Bernie. Even conservatives I ran into canvassing in New Hampshire respected his integrity. Some people might have unconscious regret that they could not bring themselves to support him in the promise of his campaign. For others, perhaps he can now be safely adored in the abstract since he's not so concretely running for president. People perceive Bernie to be authentic and for real at a time when the system we live under seems so profoundly indifferent to everyday people's well-being. But for the left, I think, the Bernie meme sated something more specific. A nostalgia for the feeling of unity, the sense of purpose, the downright optimism that defined our politics up until the moment nearly one year ago that Biden took the nomination and the pandemic descended. Bernie's loss left a void on the U.S. left. It's the sort of void that my guest today, sociologist Paolo Garbaldo, warns against in his book The Digital Party, political organization, and online democracy. The book is a remarkable examination of a new sort of politics and political party that has emerged, often but by no means exclusively on the left, in an era shaped by the internet and the neoliberal breakdown in organizational life. Digital parties, Gerbaudo writes, promise real democracy through radical disintermediation and direct participation. But what they often provide instead is a fraught dynamic between a small number of what Garbaldo calls hyperleaders and a reactive and relatively powerless internet dwelling superbase. The digital party is, quote, marked by an organizational polarization that strengthens the party's center and periphery at the expense of the intermediate bureaucratic element. Thereby, a charismatic hyperleader becomes allied with a digitally activated, yet mostly reactive, superbase, leading to a situation in which centralized and personalized leadership at the top exists in a state of tension with mass participationism at the bottom. The digital party, quote, bears the promise of disintermediating politics, making it more similar to the immediacy, interactivity, and instantaneity of social experience in the digital era while doing away with a number of middlemen, bureaucrats, consultants, spin doctors, suspected of being responsible for many of the ills of contemporary politics and the way it distorts the authentic will of the people. But, 
quote, disintermediation always implies an act of re-intermediation. The ideological function of the discourse of disintermediation is obfuscating the reality of re-intermediation and the power relations that are involved in it. And so this illusion that we can live without leaders, ironically, it leads to a situation where we end up with many fewer leaders who are way more powerful and less accountable. Lost in the mix are the party cadre, a key intermediate layer of leadership that is necessary if an organization's top is to be democratically linked to its bottom. Our disorganization means that a hyper leader like Bernie, losing as Bernie did, can transform his supporters' euphoria into dysphoria. Right now, we just have too little in the way of routinized organizational life to absorb the blow of defeat and keep going. It's a situation that created an opening for a rogue hyper leader, YouTube comedian Jimmy Dore, to mobilize a disaffected super base and mount a destructive campaign against the left's most important leaders, using, revealingly, the same forms of social media and media spectacle that sustain our current leadership. It ended with people left more pessimistic and cynical than ever in the name of empowerment and accountability. In reality, we have not won Medicare for All because we have not built enough organized power to win such a huge victory, a victory that would end an entire sector of capitalist industry. But Doors followers were led to believe that sellout leaders were the problem alongside organizations and their so-called gatekeepers. Instead, they believed that mobilizing as an amorphous internet mass could fundamentally change things, awakening an American people whose suffering left them on the verge of mass action. All they needed, it was hoped, was their spark, if only. We need our leaders. Any political movement or party needs leaders. In fact, we need many, many more leaders. And we need stronger organizations not only to hold those leaders accountable, but also so that a whole lot of people can develop their own leadership and partake in democratically and substantively charting the course of our struggles. At present, too many have been left with a sense of powerless in the wake of Bernie's loss, encouraging a revival of politics as performance and the sense that the very idea of having a strategy is selling out to the system. It's a revival of ultra tactics, whether in pursuit of force the votes, social democratic reform, or in the case of Tanky's bizarre resurrection of authoritarian state communism. The siren song of ultra politics in either case is this idea that it's the dramatic and romantic last, best, and only hope to break free of what can feel like an impossible situation. I can't recommend Paolo's book enough for organizers everywhere. Groups like DSA are building the sorts of organizations we need where people can plug in, take action, and learn how to lead and organize. But we are still way, way too disorganized, and so many of the people out there who are committed to our politics experience them in the most superficial ways through fandom around hyperleaders, YouTube celebrities, and, yes, podcast hosts. Before we get rolling... This podcast is free and available to all listeners because those of you listeners who can afford to support us do so at patreon.com slash the dig. If you like this podcast and you can afford to support us and you appreciate that we give every episode away for free, regardless of your ability to contribute, because that is very, very important to us. We would not have it any other way please do make a monthly contribution now. If you contribute at least 10 bucks a month, we will send you a left-wing book or books in the mail as a token of our gratitude. We are also finally getting mugs and tote bags. Mugs are already on their way. Tote bags, I'm still putting the final touches on. That is p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Also, check out the dig book club discuss books discussed on the show with their authors on zoom next up is work won't love you back how devotion to our jobs keeps us exploited exhausted and alone by sarah jaffe visit the dig radio.com slash dig hyphen book hyphen club to join up that link will be in the show notes alongside links to past dig episodes that address topics discussed 
in this interview. Okay, here is Paolo Garbalo, a sociologist and political theorist working at King's College London. He is the author of The Digital Party, Political Organization and Online Democracy, and of The Great Recoil, Politics After Populism and Pandemic, forthcoming from Verso. Hello, Gerbaldo. Welcome to The Dig. Hello, Daniel. Let's start with a really basic question for my fellow Americans. What is a political party? What do we in the U.S. have instead? And what are the consequences for the U.S. having this exceptional and strange system? Perhaps we can start from uh, German sociologist Max Weber definition of the political party, which can be paraphrased as a, a voluntary organization whose aim is advancing uh, the interest uh, of its members and uh, of its leaders and of a number of, of political goals within a larger organization, namely a state. So this definition of, by Max Weber, then there are many similar definitions that have been uh, formulated in, uh, in the course of history, I think provides a quite good understanding of what a political party is. So on the one hand, the, the, there is a voluntary element of association, namely nobody is forced to be part of a party, which is different in threat from larger corporate bodies, such as states, where you are a citizen, right, by, by birth, and you are, in a way, <laughs> obliged to be a citizen. But then, throughout history, this party form has acquired very different shapes. Uh, we can think about the elite parties, uh, we can think about the Jacobin, the Whigs, and then later on we can think about the mass parties that perhaps are still the kind of party most people are thinking about when they are discussing political parties, parties with mass membership and with thousands and tens of thousands of people working for these parties to end with more recent parties, uh, so-called uh, professional electoral parties that have become prominent during the neoliberal age. In fact, there is also a very a strong difference across the pond, across the Atlantic, between parties in the U.S. and parties in Europe. In the U.S. system, parties have historically been less structured, uh, less organized. They have taken the form more of electoral committees, emerging, uh, becoming visible at times of, of, of elections, during election campaigns, while not engaging in uh, other tasks that parties elsewhere have usually uh, performed, namely the task of social integration, uh, of organizing society, of creating a political culture, which is instead the important integrative function that political parties have played elsewhere, and um, particularly in, in Western Europe. And part of that is you really can't be a member of a U.S. political party in the way that you can be a member of a normal, conventional political party. Yes, because in the U.S., in a way, parties are an extension of the state. When a person, a citizen, registers as, as a voter, uh, is asked whether they want to register as, as Democrat or as Republicans or as independents. Therefore, it is, in a way, the, the contrary of the, of the European party system, where in order to become a member, usually the, there was quite a um, laborious process where you had to really uh, go to the party, go to a party branch. Uh, in some cases, in more sectarian parties, also undergo an interview process to demonstrate that you were really were, were in line with the principles of the party, uh, commit to undertake political labor, pay your membership dues, which in certain circumstances, circumstances were also quite significant. And if you were not doing that, you could be uh, eliminated from the party role at some point. Right? So these are two quite different understandings of what a political party is. Your book is about what you call digital parties, and it covers disparate sorts of parties and movements. 
the Five Star Movement in Italy, Podemos in Spain, various pirate parties, France and Sumis, momentum in the UK Labour Party, the pro corporate movement in the UK Labour Party, the Bernie campaign here in the US, and there are a lot of different ideologies at play. The pirate parties are really narrowly digital about kind of internet politics. Five Star initially had this greenish sort of platform, but then more recently allied with the xenophobic far right. Podemos is more traditionally left wing and France and Sumi perhaps even more so. And the Bernie campaign and momentum aren't political parties at all, but ways, I guess, that political traditional parties are getting digitized. What makes all of these disparate parties and movements, what makes them all digital in your framework? What makes all these parties uh, digital parties is fundamentally uh, the fact that they follow a common uh, organizational template. I mean, in fact, there are also some ideological similarities among most of them, because many of them are have been described as left populist parties or anti-establishment parties. But really, the most prominent common feature is the fact that they think that, that the internet provides an opportunity for a better democracy. And the fact that they have invested a lot in organizational innovation, in transforming the party structure in order to make it more participatory. Because of the perception, because of their diagnosis, that part of the political malaise, as it is being described, part of the distrust of citizens towards the political class, derives precisely from the neoliberal dis distortion of political parties and the way in which party elites have severed themselves from uh, traditional social bases of support. So across all these parties, you will see that there is a discourse of digital democracy, a discourse of disintermediation, and a practice of creating what are very easily described as participatory platforms or participation platforms or participation portals namely sections of the official party websites where party members can perform a number of, of actions that qualify them uh, as members from uh, joining the party, right? Often simply by clicking a button after having typed your name, making donations, uh, participating in online discussions, uh, participating in consultations, attending online tra uh, training sessions, uh, so, in a way, the participatory platform becomes the key organizational structure in this new party form. And they also share a certain organizational dynamic that you write about. Digital parties, as you write, promise real democracy through this radical disintermediation and direct participation. But you write that they are, quote, marked by an organizational polarization that strengthens the party's center and periphery at the expense of the intermediate bureaucratic element. Thereby, a charismatic hyperleader becomes allied with a digitally activated, yet mostly reactive super base, leading to a situation in which centralized and personalized leadership at the top exists in a state of tension with mass participationism at the bottom. Quote, it bears the promise of disintermediating politics, making it more similar to the immediacy, interactivity, and instantaneity of social experience in the digital era, while doing away with a number of middlemen, bureaucrats, consultants, spin doctors, suspected of being responsible for many of the ills of contemporary politics and the way it distorts the authentic will of the people. But some of those middlemen, you note, are party cadre, a key intermediate layer of leadership. And you write that, quote, disintermediation always implies an act of re-intermediation. The ideological function of the discourse of disintermediation is obfuscating this reality of re-intermediation and the power relations that are involved in it. We're, we're going to get into each facet of this in a lot more detail, but for now, can you sketch out your argument of what sort of, of organizations and politics are created behind this utopian promise of unmediated popular power? Yes, I'd say that in a way what I'm trying to do with the book is comparing and contrasting uh, the promise and the reality of these parties. 
And when we look at the promise, it is a promise that really revolves around this idea of disintermediation. I mean, it's a term that, that has been mobilized a lot, not only by pirate parties, uh, but also, for example, by Beppe Grillo, the founder of the Five Star Movement, that is perhaps the most successful example of these parties, but also by other figures, including Francis Sumis, uh, more kind of clearly left these parties, such as Francis Sumis and, and Podemos. And what this idea of disintermediation uh, in, reflects is this perception of, of a distance, right, between uh, citizens and, and institutions, citizens and, and the sites of political decision making. I think which is in a way uh, a vision that is in line with the movements of 2011, right, with Occupy Wall Street, uh, the Indignados, all these movements that were campaigning for a real democracy because they perceived that part of the reasons why things were going so badly with austerity, with cuts to public budgets, uh, with uh, mass poverty and so on and so forth after the 2008 uh, financial crisis was down to the fact that people had been disempowered. Because people had no access to the levers of power. There was a sort of, uh, uh, there was a break in the linkage, in traditional linkage between uh, uh, representatives and represented. And obviously this intermediation is also a very common term in, in digital culture. Right? I mean, all these apps we have these days on our phones, all these services, what they're promising us is to eliminate the middleman, allowing us direct access to anything, uh, be it uh, a, a hotel room or, or a home or a house, uh, as in the case of Airbnb or a cab, right, directly without having to dial a ca local cab company or even the, the stock exchange, as we saw recently uh, in these days with a GameStop, right, online trading wars, right? Now all these online trading apps allowing you uh, retail investors, uh, as they are described, to directly buy stock. So on, on the one hand, there is all really an explicit promise that what these parties are going to do is basically the same thing that Airbnb and Uber did with consumption they are going to do the same with politics. I mean, this is literally what the current speaker of the House of Representatives in Italy told me, actually before becoming the leader of the House of Representatives. He is a member of the Five Star Movement. That's how he put it to me, how the Five Star Movement works. Yeah, the problem is that indeed, as, as uh, you were saying, were, were saying reading that quote from my book, this idea of this intermediation is a red herring, really, because this applies both to consumption, uh, consumer apps, and, and to politics. When you disintermediate, it is not only a process of destruction of existing forms of, of mediation. This intermediation always carries the construction of new forms of mediation and intermediation in place of the old ones that have been destroyed. Something that's obscured by the myth of the possibility of total disintermediation. Completely, completely. In a way, you know, like the ideology in some of these parties more markedly, but more generally across all of them, is an ideology of leaderlessness. And that's how there are some continuities with Occupy as well, right? I mean, for example, Gian Roberto Casaleggio, the guru, the digital guru of the Five Star Movement, a person who was uh, involved in, in IT, uh, he has this uh, eponymous uh, IT firm called Casaleggio Associati, which still curates the communication of the Five Star Movement. He was a fan of Occupy Wall Street and actually uh, of David Graeber, for example. And he had this idea really that leaderlessness was, was the aim, was the goal. So at the outset in, with the Five Star Movement, the idea was to develop an organizational system that would do away uh, with all forms of, of leadership and, and hierarchy, allowing uh, the platform, the digital assembly of all registered members to make decisions directly, right? With the representatives turning into sort of avatars of the collective will of the of the members. 
uh, but it didn't really work out this way. Let's turn to some history. You write about how the digital party has taken off amid this crisis in the technocratic, spin-doctored party of the post-Cold War neoliberal era, the so-called television party, which had, in its time, displaced the mass party of the industrial era. You write, quote, political parties are anchored in deep-seated social cleavages that correspond to exceptional revolutionary turns of the modern era. And it was neoliberalized parties, television parties, you write, that dislodged themselves from their class bases, that hollowed out party cadre and also the party base, and that replaced cadre with consultants to spin spin their politics to this abstracted and passive mass audience sitting in their recliners at home. And then and so digital parties follow television parties in attacking the middlemen, the cadre, the bureaucrats. But at the same time, they try to recreate this mass, the mass party's mass base, even if in a much more superficial form. How have modes of production on the one hand and communication and technology on the other hand, how, how have they shaped the social formations that have made political parties what they've been over time, leading us to where we are today with the rise of the digital party? Yes, I mean, I take my initial inspiration to develop this uh, question from Marco Revelli, uh, a very influential Italian Marxist author, who uh, in a book on political parties draws an analogy between mode of production and mode of organization, precisely. Uh, What he says is that the mass party was styled after the Fordist factory, with its uh, gigantic structure, with its system of vertical integration, uh, with uh, uh, the presence of very very clear hierarchy, right? And a very clear stratification of uh, functions, right? From the top uh, to the bottom. And he also argues that in the neoliberal era, the transformation of the capitalist system had was reflected in the transformation of political parties from from mass parties into television parties. Therefore, at a point in time when services become the kind of key area of capitalist value production, uh, when communication, marketing, advertising become central to capitalism, they also become central to political parties. And, And the case of Silvio Berlusconi in Italy is a perfect example in, in, to, to illustrate this, right? I mean, as Guy Debord said, Italy is the laboratory of uh, reaction from the counter-reformation onwards. And really, <laughs> when it comes to politics, it really, <laughs> this uh, dictum, I think, is really valid. So what Berlusconi did was turning his media empire into a political empire, where he basically was using the pollsters, the graphic designers, the creatives, the advertisers that he already had anyway, and use them not anymore just for commercial purposes, but also for for political purposes. So in a way, we can look at the digital party as the last, as a new chapter, right, in this parallel development of the economy and politics, namely all these innovations coming from, from Silicon Valley, from the world of startups, from uh, the philosophy of lean management or agile management, as it is described, are now being translated in, into the political field. On some level, it's surprising. It's been surprising to people that that they're new parties at all because there had been this widespread presumption that political parties were on their way to irrelevancy with information society, the post-industrial neoliberal breakdown in conventional class identity and, and community, the decline of the nation state, the purported decline of the nation state. But but the party's death, it turns out, was very much prematurely announced. You write about how that the, the past decade plus of economic and political conditions created this crisis of legitimacy for the established political parties, but that then helped spur the emergence of the digital party. What accounts for in this 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 context of of economic crisis both both acute and then more systematic and permanent what accounts for the digital party's particular appeal to people you call quote connected outsiders people who are caught in a condition of dissonance between their cultural and socioeconomic conditions young educated very online but economically insecure and feeling shut out by the political system people 
who are, quote, at the same time the digital revolution's most most enthusiastic advocates and its most vocal discontents. Yes, I think behind this party, we see the emergence of a, of a new electorate uh, that is uh, overwhelmingly composed by young people, by millennials and Generation Z. And many of these people uh, originate from uh, the middle class, the lower tiers of the middle class, in a sense of people who have uh, had educational opportunities, who don't see those educational opportunities actually translated into uh, employment opportunities. Uh, in France, for example, the electorate of La France Insoumise, of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, was described as made of diplômés déclassés, right? So graduates uh, without a future, as Paul Mason put it in reference to the composition of the 2011 protest movements. And I think this is a very growing phenomenon that is very important. This doesn't mean that this is the only section of the electorate this party represent. This party also represent working class voters, in particular from, from the service working class, uh, the service precariat, so-called. This is particularly the case with the Five Star Movement. But I think that this middle class, uh, uh, this decline in middle class component is very important also because it tends to be the social section from which activists are overwhelmingly recruited. And many of these people uh, live in a situation, in a great contradiction, right? In a sense that uh, they are basically the most educated generation in history, a uh, ge generation that can speak often many languages, that had a lot of travel opportunities and opportunities for intellectual self-development. Uh, but then they see that uh, they face an economic system that uh, at the same time has devalued their labor, has devalued their contribution. And therefore, in that sense, they are outsiders. Right? And I think that this frustration is really one uh, of the key motivations that, that motivates these people to partake in political activity. Your book, as you mentioned, it primarily focuses on left or sometimes sort of liberal parties, though, though Five Star is a telling wild card that we'll get into more. But are there also digital parties of the right? Did did Trump bring a sort of digital politics to the Republican Party? Do you, do you identify a sort of digital party type politics at work in, say, QAnon or the various web-based far-right Trumpists who descended on the U.S. Capitol? recently, or for that matter, in this more incohate anti-system politics that's performatively often post-political, but in fact, in practice, very far right, that has emerged under the pandemic, the diagonalist politics that, that Quinn Slobodian and William Callison recently wrote about in a really excellent Boston Review essay. Groups of, quote, angry freelancers and the self-employed, amplified by entrepreneurs of speculative and totalizing prophecies who, quote, share a conviction that all power is conspiracy. Are, are these nascent digital parties of the right or something else? Yes, I think they could be broadly described as uh, following the principles of, of the digital party. I mean, when I, I wrote the book, the kind of cases that I had in mind were more uh, parties that were, in a way, renewing the idea of membership-based organization, namely of organizations where you can be a member and where members are given, new, uh, once again, forms of control over the direction of their organization. But similar um, dynamics apply also to non-members organization, to more fluid and, and uh, evanescent partly uh, online crowds. I think that the, the idea of crowd is really making a comeback and it is making a comeback because it is reflecting some of the, the dynamics we see there. And in particular, this element of uh, this dualism that you were referring to before, the dualism between hyper leader and super base is really evident there. So what this dualism means is that we see on the one hand some degree of greater empowerment for for the base of users namely users can do f users slash members uh, say political supporters can do things that in the past were more difficult to do 
They can reply to messages. They can participate in consultations. They can share things. They can personalize their political participation more. But contrary to the predictions of um, these intermediation uh, prophets, this doesn't lead to leaderlessness. Rather, it leads to a situation in which you have charismatic leadership figures emerging at the lead of these, uh, leading these crowds. And I think the case of Trump and Trumpistas is, is really an excellent case of that, right? Uh, it is based on a disintermediated connection between the leader and his supporters who love the leader, right? One of the most striking thing in, in the rallies, uh, in the last rallies of Donald Trump, were people uh, chanting, we love you, we, we love you, with Trump obviously uh, using the chance to say, look, these people love me, right? Which was not something that we were used to seeing in politics for a long time, right? It resembles more a social movement or, or a charismatic movement you know, with some millenarian elements, I think, that the thesis is, is, is right, which see the current political scenario as a sort of ultimate battle uh, between good and evil and uh, uh, pursues a sort of hero worship, uh, sort of cult, cult of personality of the leader as the only figure that will deliver us from uh, uh, this sorry situation. The Pirate Party was was the first digital party, but also the most most narrowly consumed by digital politics, which makes sense given that the first pirate party was founded in Sweden in 2006 after courts shut down the popular file sharing site Pirate Bay. And revealingly, pirate parties have not aged so well. If I read the most current figures right, three out of only four current pirate members of the European Parliament are from the Czech Republic. What accounts for pirate parties' narrow emphasis on digital liberty when, by contrast, all these other parties you studied tend to also have a major emphasis on, on economic populism? Is it just the, the result of pirate parties having been founded prior to the 2008 economic crisis and then digital, the more standard digital party emerges after that with a different suite or a more expansive suite of policies? I think it has to do with the history of, of the internet and how it has developed so rapidly in, in recent years. And this development has led from, uh, to a shift from an elite phenomenon to a mass phenomenon, right? And that is reflected in the genesis of these parties and the different issues they have mobilized. Uh, I mean, let's just consider two figures. I mean, worldwide in the year 2000, only 10% of the world population was online. In 2010, it was already 50%. So these parties that emerged in the mid notice were parties that were appealing to a people of the web or a people of the internet that was at the time still a very minority phenomenon, especially in terms of uh, very high intensity users. And therefore, uh, it appealed to issues that were of interest for people who were particularly into tech and all related things, right? Privacy, uh, peer-to-peer, freedom of expression, against censorship, and so on and so forth. While progressively, other parties came to encompass other issues that were emerging at the time. The Five Star Movement, again, is a very interesting case because, in a way, it starts from a similar cultural background, right, of techno-utopia combined with some ecological demands, typically demands that tend to appeal to to a middle-class constituency. But then it broadens its policy platform to other questions, and ultimately the reason for its overwhelming success in uh, the last parliamentary election in Italy in, the two, in 2018 was its promise to introduce uh, a minimum guaranteed income to poor families, right? A policy that was appealing to people who perhaps did not have even an internet connection or people who were not at all, say, uh, graduates without a future, but people without a future without even being graduates. And in fact, that won the Five Star Movement uh, mass support in some very poor regions of Italy, such as Campania, where it went up well above 40% of the vote. 
So in some cases, they really became a populist phenomena in, in also in terms of electoral support in, in the sense of uh, attracting backing from the actual popular classes. One digital candidate who emerged here in the U.S. after your book was published is Andrew Yang, the Democratic primary candidate from Reddit, where his candidacy took off on his call for UBI, Universal Basic Income, a call that really revealingly won him a following not only on the left and amongst kind of more amorphous, politically amorphous parts of American politics, but on the far right. He was complimented by by Richard Spencer, a sort of, to use Slobodian and, and Callison's language, a sort of diagonalist dynamic. Why has UBI as a specific form of social protection, in contrast to the other forms of social protection that could be demanded, been one staple of digital parties' response to economic crisis and inequality since 2008? And, and then how does today's Yang or five-star UBI politics that, of course, have also changed dramatically since the pandemic's onset, but how does that compare to the idea of UBI that was put forward by autonomous Marxists in the 1970s, because they seemed different somehow. Yes, if, I'd say that it's very interesting how UBI has become a flagship policy for many of these groups. I mean, that's how the First Star Movement also marketed its own policy, but actually is a rather different thing since it is a kind of conditional and means-tested uh, policy uh, that is not, as in the case of UBI, it would be basically the entire population, right, that receives the, this paycheck from the state. While in the case of reddito di cittadinanza, namely citizens' uh, income, uh, which is the Five Star Movement policy that is only targeted on, on uh, poor families. Uh, at the moment, uh, around one million and a half families in Italy receive uh, out of uh, uh, whatever 30, 35 million family are receiving these transfer from the state. And it's interesting indeed that, as you say, also Andrew Young became really popular because of that policy. That was how he, he uh, became viral, right? I mean, every, everyone was, was uh, creating memes about him. Also the f- fortune crowd, right? Yeah, and, it, and it's, yeah, extremely popular, particularly amongst people who are extremely online. And yeah, like you just mentioned, 4chan. Exactly. So the, the fortune people, the very people that produced the Pepper the Frog memes, uh, some of them say were uh, enthused by, by Andrew Young. And I have say that there are a lot of debates about whether UBI is a policy that uh, is actually good or bad. I mean, some people, for example, say that, that Milton Friedman proposed similar policies uh, to his idea of negative taxation. But I'd say probably the reason why it has become so popular is that it is seen as more realistic than, for example, a a job guarantee, right? Which instead is the policy that has been promoted by by other people, such as people close to the modern monetary theory uh, circles. And in a way, um, it provides a sort of apparently easy solution to the current situation of lack of employment uh, by basically saying we will guarantee uh, you some transfers so that you can, so that you're able to deal with your immediate necessities. Autonomous Marxists were seeing UBI as a means to overcome uh, uh, capitalist uh, relations of production and rewarding people for the social value that was produced in society uh, outside of the workplace, right? Namely, in the context of a society, of a knowledge society, in which much of what we produce in our work activity uh, derives from resources, including symbolic resources, uh, which lie outside of the workplace. I mean, language, uh, creativity, or the fact of being in a lively neighborhood. Or wages for housework. Yes, exactly. Housework, which was also an issue that was really uh, important also for autonomous Marxists. I think they were, they were quite prescient in many of these things in seeing uh, uh, care work uh, as an increasingly, and social reproduction as an increasingly important issue. I think the debate there, uh, as also Aaron Benanav uh, raises, is the, the risk is that UBI is just going to be used uh, basically to pacify social conflicts 
uh, rather than really addressing the, the main problems at stake in contemporary capitalism, uh, which have to do with uh, underinvestment, uh, which have to do with uh, uh, the fact that the, no further growth or, or improvement is possible under the present regime uh, of, of accumulation. Where do anti-corruption politics fit into all of this? Before Five Star's founding, Beppe Grillo, who became its figurehead, the party's figurehead, he in 2007 launched Vafanculo Day, which literally means fuck off day, targeting criminality, very much actually existing criminality, amongst members of the Italian parliament. But what are the politics of anti-corruption? Obviously, corruption is bad, but what does it mean for anti-corruption to be so central to a party or movement's ideology? Yes, I think corruption is a huge question in, in many of these parties, um, particularly the, the Five Star Movement that coined this, sta- this term, the, the case, right, from the Indian case system, right, to describe the political overclass, uh, as Michael Lind uh, calls it, yeah, the overclass of uh, powerful politicians, technocrats, and so on and so forth. And interestingly, then this term was also borrowed by uh, Podemos in Spain. The reason why corruption and and white-collar crime has become so prominent is that because there there is a perception that to some extent is well-motivated, the sum of the reasons for, uh, for some of the reasons for the problems uh, citizens are are currently experiencing derive uh, from uh, this alliance, from this complicity between the business class and the political class, politicians that are in cahoots with entrepreneurs and often are receiving a lot of money from entrepreneurs in the form of donations uh, uh, that may be legal or or illegal. I mean, we have also seen uh, recently what has happened, for example, with Tony Blair and all these uh, phenomenon of politicians on hire, for hire, uh, recently, the former prime minister of Italy, Matteo Renzi, uh, who has uh, uh, now uh, led uh, to the downfall of, of Conte's government, uh, uh, the alliance between Five Star Movement and Partito Democratico, the center-left coalition, uh, was recently uh, very harshly criticized because he, it surfaced that he uh, was part of the board of the uh, Saudi Arabia Sovereign Wealth Fund, and it was receiving quite uh, significant money to do that. So there is this sentiment, there is this denunciation of uh, corruption, of political corruption, of lobbying, because all these mechanisms are perceived as mechanisms that have distorted uh, the general will, the mechanism that interfere uh, with the ability of citizens to control political decisions, that they are uh, the manifestation of this yawning gap, right, between ordinary citizens uh, and and the site uh, of political decision. And anti-corruption then ties into this broader sense that there's this elite closure between all different sorts of elites, government, industry, media, a sense that that what are called cartel parties or the partidocracy have created a situation, as you write, where, quote, it is as if parties stopped representing citizens within the state, turning instead to representing the state among citizens. Yes, there is a sort of inversion, right, of the normal flow of uh, the general will, right? because the, the, the idea that, that political parties are a part of the population and then they uh, act as uh, much as, as individuals would do in a small group, voicing the interest of a specific section of society. Uh, but then with, with cartel parties, you see the, the opposite going on, namely parties acting as a sort of uh, extensions of the state, uh, trying to uh, control uh, society, trying to reach responsibility, trying to justify austerity. I mean, in the case of Italy and the uh, center-left Democratic Party, but I think many other dem- social democracy parties, uh, this is really what, what has happened. I mean, these parties have become the parties of responsibility, uh, which uh, mostly in this context mean uh, convincing people to accept uh, progressive worsening of their social conditions, 
with the justification that basically these changes are inevitable, that times are bad, and there's no way we can go against the, the tide of history. It's interesting in this sense how the discourse of reform and reformism has changed, right? I mean, back in the days, uh, uh, reform was a reform of revolution was one of the two options of the socialist movement. And therefore was the idea, for example, of Fabians, uh, a sort of slow and progressive uh, improvement of the conditions of the working class and the popular classes. While now when these people are talking about reforms, they thinking more about structural reforms, IMF style. Yeah, reforms now mean things getting worse, not things getting better slowly. Yes, it's incredible how <laughs> this semantic slide has, has taken place, right? And it has been accepted almost uh, uh, without much uh, criticism or reproach, partly because it's actually the same people who are saying the same things that now mean different things, if you see what I mean. In a sense, these are the hairs to, the, to social democracy, the hairs to the Fabians, to the incrementalism of progressive social reforms, who are now preaching uh, counter reforms, really, uh, to do away with those uh, 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 with those gains made by the popular classes uh, uh, during the, the, the golden age of social democracy. You write about how the emphasis on process and procedure over ideology and program can have seriously pernicious consequences for ideology and program. Quote, what keeps the party together is not anymore the adherence to and pursuit of a given set of policies that are seen to embody the party's objectives in accordance with its ideology, but rather the ethos of open participation and the members' experience of common involvement in decision-making and campaign efforts, something you call participationism. You continue, quote, these parties belie the dangerous illusion that politics can be resolved simply through a change in process and restructuring of internal organization rather than through a systematic overhaul of social structures and political institutions. And this, you argue, I think most importantly, or most powerfully, is what facilitated Five Star's wild swing from left to right wing. And your book opens with that, with a, a scene, setting the scene with the Five Star Movement in May 2018, celebrating a low turnout referendum that overwhelmingly backed their governing pact with Matteo Salvini's fanatically racist anti-immigrant right wing Lega party. I think what we are witnessing there in this participationism, that's how I describe the general ideology of this party, namely an ideology of participation as the ultimate good, is an element of proceduralism. I mean, uh, proceduralism as a belief uh, in process and in procedure as what is going to guarantee fundamentally the validity of uh, the political uh, uh, political force. I mean, in a way, uh, proceduralism was, again, at the heart of, of Occupy Wall Street and similar uh, protest movements had a very loose identity, right? We are the 99%. We stand for the people. But whose uh, key element of identification relied in the idea of we are democratic. We have a democratic process. We have consensus-based decision-making. Ultimately, what qualifies us and what justifies our action, what legitimizes our action, is the fact that we follow democratic and open rules. Therefore, in much of these parties, you see a similar reasoning. So the idea that as long as the method is, is correct, as long as you're open and democratic, as long as you allow the people to speak, the results will ultimately be positive. The, the results will ultimately be uh, what is necessary in the present historical condition. Uh, and this is obviously a very gross mistake in, in, uh, in understanding what politics is about, right? Because politics is not just form, politics is, is also content because it is impossible to find an agreement among people, for example, who are starting from radically different viewpoints. And proceduralism and this obsession with process, with obsession with the, the democratic process, ultimately also leads to uh, incoherence. It leads to the fact that sometimes these parties change significantly their policy position through time. 
I mean, again, the Five Star Movement is a remarkable example because it went from an alliance with uh, the rabid uh, racist uh, Salvini's Lega to an alliance now with the center-left Democratic Party. And it is as if uh, they had two referendums to do this on the party online participatory platform. And in both cases, there were overwhelming shares of uh, uh, voters in the consultations that voted in favor of one thing and the other. Uh, so this really tells you uh, how uh, there is a risk of excessive eclecticism in these parties when the only element of coherence is the process. Robert Mickles, one of history's most famous critics of organization, also went from the German Social Democratic Party to being a fan of Mussolini. Do you see an echo there in the work of this famous critic of organization a, a critic of what he called the iron law of oligarchy? Yes, I think there is. there are some uh, strange and, and uh, uncanny resemblances between some of the tendencies back at the beginning of the 20th century and uh, some of the present trends, also in terms of organizational thinking. Because ultimately, for people like Michels, these uh, perhaps, I mean, legitimate, motivated distrust of the party intermediate structure, uh, what Antonio Gramsci called the third element, right? The intermediary element between the top and the bottom, between the leader and, and the base of the party, ultimately led to this sort of nihilist position saying if uh, uh, inevitably or organization leads to oligarchy, and therefore to a distortion of the popular will, the only solution to that is uh, adopting, uh, is following a charismatic leader who is strong enough, uh, basically, to win over the party bureaucracy and ultimately be a better voice, a better channel of uh, the party members' actual concerns. I think partly, I mean, with Donald Trump, uh, right. I mean, many people who uh, supported Donald Trump, what party was because they distrusted the, the Republican Party, uh, which they saw as an organization that, has, that was completely uh, controlled by a political oligarchy, the Bush family and all the interest groups. And therefore, they saw in this uh, uh, figure, in this uh, maverick millionaire, billionaire who had, uh, who dare present himself as an outsider, someone who could be a more um, loyal representative of the voice of the people. So there is a real risk that we move from what Michels describes as the iron law of oligarchy uh, to uh, an even worse law of authoritarianism because of uh, distrust, a skepticism about organization. Uh, which is legitimate, obviously, uh, can then lead to something even worse, uh, that is leaders without uh, no control at all from the party structure. Digital parties are organized in the f a form that you call, quote, distributed centralization, where the opening of the party's bottom is accompanied by an increasing concentration of power in the hands of the charismatic party leader, the hyper leader in his or her immediate entourage. And the victim of this model, as you just mentioned, is the middle layer, party cadre. What did Gramsci mean when he described cadre, as you write, quote, as a necessary articulating texture between the leadership and the membership? Why, why is it that cadre are then seen as illegitimate gatekeepers, even as top leadership concentrates power? And then what, lastly, what is lost when this intermediate layer of leadership disappears or withers? Yes, uh, in Gramsci has developed a very interesting discussion of political party in the section, in the famous section on the modern prince, uh, where he proposes uh, a threefold uh, structure for political parties. Interestingly, he says that the most important part of a party, before supporters even, is the leadership, the generals of the party. Interestingly, he says that it is easier to create an army than to form generals. 
This is quite counterintuitive, but it really shows how important for Gramsci the element of political leadership was. Then the second element, obviously, is the base of the party, that is, is the section of society, is the social class that the leadership group wants to mobilize. And finally, there is this intermediate element, which is basically the functionaries, the people who are directly employed by the party or the local representatives of the, of the party and the various uh, physical structures, right? The party also utilize uh, the various offices, the printing presses, uh, the gathering points. I mean, in the case of the SPD, the famous uh, uh, German Social Democratic Party that became a model for many mass parties, they even had Parteikneipen, namely party towers, they were owned by the party and that played a very important function, not only as uh, socialization uh, hotspots, but also as places where people could have political debate lubricated by abundant beer. And for Gramsci, you, this intermediate structure was fundamental to allow the party to set roots in, in, in society, to become a, an organization of that capillary reach and that could play an integrative function, right? That could not only represent society, but actually organize society. Though this is precisely the element of the party that uh, these uh, uh, digital parties are most skeptical of. Yeah, the, the web platform being central and the cadre being weakened or, or eliminated is part of digital parties being nowhere and so hypothetically, or at least ostensibly, everywhere. You write, quote, the digital party seems to be pervaded by something akin to terror loci, the fear of place, or better, the fear of being identified with a specific place. Offices, branches, clubs, all those places which gave parties a concrete presence in geographic space are mostly absent. What accounts for this allergy to rootedness that you started to touch on with your assessment of the declining role of cadre. And what's what's lost when you don't have geographic division of an organization and instead just an abstract mass of, of people? What's important about what you call the principle of place? Digital parties have this suspicion for officiality, right? For uh, the institutional element of politics uh, and officiality it derives from from the office, right? From the actual physical place where uh, uh, bureaucratic organizations have their uh, the, the space of operation. Indeed, as we know, bureaucracy derives from uh, the French word for for office. Again, the Five Star Movement provides an interesting uh, uh, illustration of this. In this interview, I had with the current uh, uh, speaker of the Italian House of Deputies of the Five Star Movement, he was describing me the early stage of the Five Star Movement where they were having these assemblies in different places in Naples, because he is from Naples, and every time they were ch trying to change location. And something that they would never entertain was the idea of actually renting or purchasing a place, which they could have afforded because at that point they had a sufficient scale to do that and many people eager to donate. Uh, because they thought that having a physical locale, a physical office uh, to gather, would have uh, then led to a bureaucratization of the movement. And this is uh, exemplified also by other parties, uh, Podemos, which in the book, as I described, its official headquarters are really, really modest. There is no uh, visible element of the presence of Podemos there. And even La Repubblica March of uh, Emmanuel Macron, which I don't discuss in the book, but as some people noted to me, could be described also as a digital party. I've even spoken with a person work like a, a center, a cent, cent, center populist digital party or something. Exactly, yes, centrist, yeah, center populist. There is incredibly such a thing as a center populist, <laughs> right? I mean, we often uh, we have long debated about uh, the possibility of left populism, and we know all too well about right wing populism. But what some people often uh, overlook is the fact that there is also such a thing as uh, centrist populism, often animated by a sort of middle-class radicalism combined uh, with uh, anti-elitism and suspicion of, of the elites. I mean, uh, what I was saying is that 
even La Repubblica March that definitely uh, shouldn't have problems uh, uh, with uh, monetary problems, right? Problems uh, harnessing uh, huge donations as a quite modest office, a central office in, in central Paris. Uh, because of these, uh, this desire to disassociate oneself from the old imaginary of the party as a structure... Uh, that controls a number of people. Um, this perception ultimately of inauthenticity, right? This perception that if there is an organization, it means that something bad will, will be going on. Uh, I mean, is a Michelsian uh, really suspicion that I saw represented in many contexts. I remember in 2011 doing an interview with uh, an activist of Occupy Wall Street in Zuccotti Park, and the way she put it to me was that she didn't trust anything bigger than a person, right? <laughs> Regardless of whether it was a company or a corporation, anything larger than a person was to be distrusted. Which in a way it seems to, is reminiscent of this kind of small producer populism, this kind of Jeffersonian small producer populism. This kind of quite individualistic uh, distrust of bigness, of, of anything big, regardless of whether it is a multinational, a party or a state. I, as an aside to listeners, if you're curious to hear a similar critique specifically that focuses a lot specifically on what happened with Occupy, you should check out my interview with Jonathan Smucker, which I will link to in the show notes. The elimination of local party groups you write, means that there are also very few spaces outside the center to exercise real power. You write, quote, local groups are supposed to be spaces of action, not spaces of decision, in line with the assertion that while work is distributed, planning strategy has to be strongly centralized. This disconnection is bound to create significant frictions, given that often very active militants come to feel they should have a greater say on decisions. Here in the U.S., I was involved as a volunteer leader with the Bernie campaign, and one of its major innovations was distributed organizing, which did give local super volunteers significant opportunities to step up and do work traditionally reserved for campaign staff, but campaign strategy was still very much top down. How has this power dynamic played out across digital parties? And what do you think the right balance is in terms of the distribution of strategic power? Mm, I'm quite divided internally when, I, when, I think, when I'm thinking about these issues. As On the one hand, I kind of sympathize for the Leninism of uh, distributed organizing. I mean, the idea that the plan is centralized and work is distributed. And I think that has been a key advance in thinking in many recent left movements, going beyond a certain excessive suspicion of centralism that I think was prevalent in movements in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that had this strong anti-authoritarian belief in decentralization, for decentralization's sake almost. And therefore, I mean, this reassertion that centralization can be a good thing, because ultimately we need to unite our forces, we need to unite our efforts, and that also discipline, uh, a term that may sound scary, but uh, is, I mean, Gramsci, for example, used it a lot. He's, he said that the working class had to be disciplined, to be free. Uh, I think that the return of all these questions uh, is important, is necessary for a healthy and effective uh, uh, socialist effort. At the same time, uh, it's important to always realize that people will only do things for the party or for the leader as long as they feel they have a say. Uh, you cannot ask a uh, grassroots activist, uh, uh, rank and file, to do things only for the cause because it's an, a matter of necessity. I mean, only people who are a very strong sense of duty will do that. Only people who have a strong kind of ideological preparation will do that. And ultimately, you end up losing people who uh, are um, discouraged by the perception that they are being used somehow in something 
where they have little say. So I think that in it is important to give a say uh, to people to uh, make sure that distributed uh, uh, organizing is accompanied by distributed uh, uh, democracy. Some uh, occasions in which people who are participating in a campaign can have a say, only avoiding the excesses of some digital parties where this turns into a sort of Lashian culture of narcissism where uh, the idea is that the most important thing is to allow you a say, to allow you a voice, as if that was uh, that at priority over the ultimate goal, namely collective advancements uh, of, of common goals. There's this emphasis placed on the importance of deliberation in this participationist model, often through some sort of web-based platform. But you write that it tends to instead play out in practice as what you call, or what's called, plebiscitarianism. What is plebiscitarianism? And what is it about mass transparent deliberation that promises so much democracy but delivers so much less in practice? It is often overlooked that direct democracy comes into radical different shapes. I think most people on the left and in social movements, when they think about direct democracy, they will picture once again at your Occupy Wall Street assembly, right, with people uh, using hand signs and trying to use consensus-based decision-making. Namely, they will picture a form of direct democracy in which people have a qualitative say on things. People can intervene, can express themselves, can uh, debate, really. They will think about deliberation, fundamentally. While perhaps the most popular form of direct democracy in history is the referendum, right? That's what plebiscitary democracy is about. Uh, the referendum uh, uh, that has, make, uh, has made a very strong comeback in recent years, right, from the Brexit referendum uh, in, in particular. Um, there are many countries in the world that also use referendums, including Italy, right, as part of their institutional system. Uh, obviously, Switzerland and California are also widely debated cases of that. And also organizations have internal referendums. Uh, Socialist parties had referendums uh, to decide about political issues. Uh, Trade unions call referendums uh, when they have ballots, for example, on strikes. And there was a very interesting debate within the socialist movement about referendums uh, with Bernstein writing about that. A problem with referendums is the fact that they give this illusion of uh, transparency and clarity is illusion of simplicity, right? It is a Manichaean yes or no decision. While in fact, as Michels and others, and Berstein as well, have, have argued, these uh, apparently simple decision hides uh, great complexity and is can often be used by the leadership to manipulate uh, the, the base of supporters. You write, quote, The platform is never neutral. If we go beyond the illusion of the neutrality of the platform, which is a key ideological component of the digital party, it is necessary to scrutinize these key biases. What is that ideological function played by the purported neutrality of these platforms? And what are the biases and problems that then become clear upon closer inspection when you're looking at digital party participatory internet platforms like Five Stars Rousseau and Podemos's Participa. Yes, I think that there's a lot of been written recently about platforms uh, and uh, platform capitalism, the excellent book by Nick Srinicek, uh, The Platform Society by Pearl and, and Van Dijk. So there is this idea that platforms have become uh, the fundamental logic of contemporary uh, society, of the contemporary economic system, that platforms really shape the way in which society operates. And it is interesting how the idea of platform carries with itself a certain imaginary, right? An imaginary of horizontality. I mean... A platform is a, is a flat structure. I mean, in anarchist, uh, uh, there, there is a strand of anarchism. I don't know if you know about, about it, Daniel, that was called platformism. Basically, the idea that you should agree on, on a core platform of, of ideas and uh, uh, based on that, uh, that would allow unity 
among the different people and uh, it would pro provide a sort of uh, alternative to Leninist uh, vanguardism. Uh, sort of like the affinity groups that were common in the anti-nuclear and then anti-globalization movements? I mean, it's actually an idea that was popular in, in early anarchism. I think also people such as Makhno were uh, platformists, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that without being 100% sure. Uh, yeah, I think Nestor Makhno, the famous Nestor Makhno, the Ukrainian uh, anarchist, was a platformist. So it's interesting how, right, uh, this idea of platform was also uh, relevant in the context of anti-authoritarian uh, uh, movements in the past. I think precisely it is because this idea of platform bespeaks this idea of uh, lack of hierarchy, this idea of coming together around kind of shared uh, horizon, um, shared framework without the need. Points of unity is one phrase that at least was once upon a time popular in certain corners of the U.S. left. Yes, I think that's a similar uh, ideological position. So what that tells us is that the Leo platform carries ideas of horizontality. It carries ideas of neutrality. It is uh, designates a structure, designates a space, a sort of level playing field where it doesn't really matter. Uh, in a way, the assumption is made that there is no pre-existing bias or a power position that is going to favor, for example, one idea or one proposal over other proposals and that therefore the platform will result in a lack of distortions and a lack of uh, uh, unnecessary mediations that ultimately end up diverting uh, or watering down the general will of the people. And I mean, in a way, this is also the ideology behind mm, Facebook and Twitter, right? I mean, when they present themselves as neutral spaces, right, we, where everyone can say anything, in a way, it is the same ideology. It is the same ideology of platforms. Uh, the problem is that this is never true, that there is no pre-existing bias in any structure. By definition, the form carries uh, biases for the content that the form hosts. And there's always a, and there's always a form. <laughs> exactly. And, and more so in a political organization, which even when it is presented as extremely loose and extremely flexible. There is always an history. There is always a specificity in the kind of people that promoted it, right? It always speaks to a certain section of society. So in a way, um, my problem is with this refusal of some of these parties to commit to representing a certain section of society. Right. Ultimately, to realize that even if they don't want to be involved in the act of representation, they are unwillingly, unwittingly, a form of representation. They and actually, that's the most important thing they've done. They have given. That they represent a part of society because they're a party. Exactly. Completely. I mean, th th that's the basic meaning of a political party: is being a part. Right. Is being a part of. A larger whole, uh, and that's what allows party actually to contribute something uh, to society. And they also represent clearly social classes, right? Going back to a question you made before, right? So for a long time now, people have thought that classes don't matter anymore. But you look at the social composition of the Five Star Movement, and it represents a social block made of middle class, disgruntled, connected outsiders on the one hand. And on the other hand, by precarious workers who are at the very baseline, basically, of Italian society in terms of wages, in terms of job security, and so on and so forth. There's an incredible denial on the U.S. left amongst PMC leftists of the core role of the PMC in the U.S. left today. I think that... Dealing with, I mean, actually, that is what a part of my forthcoming book uh, uh, has to do with the new social blocks. There is a chapter on the new social blocks uh, in contemporary politics. And it deals precisely with this question a question of, of contemporary class structure and a con the question of contemporary class alignments. And what you see in contemporary society is, is that fundamentally, Western societies are divided in, into two sections, a working class section and a middle class section, which in turn are internally divided, 
right? The working class is divided between the old working class of manufacturing workers and the new working class of service workers. The middle class is divided between the old middle class of entrepreneurs, uh, business owners, uh, those who put managers there. I don't think that, prof- I think the professionals and managers are actually m- most often fighting against one another. And on the other hand, the new middle class made of uh, cultural professionals, also called sociocultural professionals, skilled workers in the public sector, for example, right? Doctors, uh, uh, designers, journalists, uh, researchers. And I think that there should be no sense of shame in, in being middle class and there should be no pretentious identification with, uh, with the working class when one is not working class. I mean, somewhere in the U.S. there was precisely a debate about this, right? That, that these days people prefer being viewed as underprivileged rather than privileged. And in a way, it is a reversal of what was happening in the neoliberal era when one was trying to bolster up one's own kind of uh, social prestige. While now it is attached to a sense of shame, right? Which is quite interesting. And I think, I mean, if you adopt this four parts division of, of social classes, you can see that they quite neatly correspond to left versus right alliances, right? The, the, the left allies service workers, uh, which in this day and age, they are the most subaltern class fraction of all. With uh, like gig, gig work, like gig workers, yeah, for gig example. workers, uh, cleaners, fast food, yeah, exactly chain workers. Uh, I mean, all these figures that have been growing and growing in recent years, while often the right has more appeal, as more appeal as a majority support among the so called old working class, especially manufacturing, that in recent years has moved more to more peripheral areas as part of a sort of internal delocalization process uh, going on in, in many countries in parallel with off- actual offshoring. I mean, there's been this farm shoring, right, that has, that has gone in parallel with uh, actual offshoring. And, and in turn, the, the middle class is divided between professionals, uh, people who basically are, are qualified to do a job, but they don't have managerial positions, they don't have actually economic power, and the people who instead, in Bourdieu's term, in Pierre Bourdieu's term, are the dominant, dominant class vis-a-vis the more intellectual or social section of the middle class, which is the dominant, dominated class. Indeed, many people who qualify as, as middle class uh, because of their education and because of their kind of white-collar job, they have a strong sense of frustration because while they live uh, perhaps relatively comfortable lives, though also this is becoming increasingly uh, not something taken for granted, they have little control over decisions about work, for example, right? Responsibilities, tasks, timetable, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and a college-educated gig worker, say, might make less money than a high school only educated but unionized manufacturing worker. Completely. And I, I think it's um, one really needs to understand the reason why certain sections, at least of manufacturing workers, are voting for the right and not reduce it to cultural reasons as this narrative of all blue collar workers are social conservatives, right? Wants to make us believe. Uh, it has to do with a number of circumstances, with the fact that for many manufacturing workers, in a way, the priority is defending rights that have already been established vis-a-vis the perception of uh, people who are lowering condition, who are threatening that status, is a sort of status anxiety kind of position, uh, vis-a-vis service workers that, by the way, are more concentrated in cities, because cities is where consumption happens, right? And these are people who are facilitating consumption of the middle class, whose material interests are quite diverse. I mean, are quite different from the one of manufacturing workers. These are people who are basically fighting for the basic rights that the working class at some point took for granted and are not taken for granted anymore for those people, right? These are people who have no job security, who are lowly unionized, 
who can be fired at will and for whom the prospect of unemployment is a far greater threat compared to manufacturing workers precisely because of their precarious position. I'm Naomi Klein. You're listening to The Dig as well you should be and you can support them on patreon.com. The Dig is produced in conjunction with Jacobin Magazine. These are tough times for publishing, but Jacobin is sticking at it, publishing over 200 original essays every month online and producing the best socialist print magazine in the English language. Jacobin's work is just so vital in creating socialist arguments that can penetrate into the mainstream and, like Marx says, change, not just interpret, the world. But this work is dependent on your support. If you're able, please consider going to jacobinmag.com slash donate and making a tax-deductible donation today. Regular monthly donations help Jacobin plan even better. That's jacobinmag.com slash donate. You'll keep Jacobin going in tough times, and Jacobin will be there for you for the struggles to come. I want to return briefly to the question about these platforms. This was a wonderful and digression that I, <laughs> that I don't that I do not regret in the slightest. <laughs> um, but but what actually happens on on the, on these platforms? One thing that jumped out to me in your book was that Podemos has this mechanism through which members can propose. I think it's like platform planks or legislation, but that no proposal has ever gotten enough support to be adopted. Yes, this was one interesting institutional uh, mechanism, institutional procedure that Podemos introduced at the outset when it had a lot of hopes in uh, uh, this possibility of uh, democratization by means of of this digital platform. And basically, it's it's called uh, Iniciativa Ciudadana y Popular, Popular and Citizens Initiative, So it was a process that allowed members of the party to make proposals that would have been uh, officially discussed by the party and eventually approved if they uh, met a number of thresholds. Uh, At the beginning, the thresholds were were really low. I cannot remember exactly the figure, but it was, for example, uh, it was something around 2% of party members backing the proposal in the initial stage. Uh, yet these thresholds, for how much they looked low, prove too high for any proposal that attempted doing that uh, to, 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 to reach. Because when you have a party that has, uh, as Podemos has now, on paper, uh, half million members, right, collecting 2% of a half million is quite a significant number of people. And I mean, some proposals, uh, uh, if I remember correctly. And they don't exist in any on the ground sort of sections or branches within which they might organize to collect those signatures. Yes, because Podemos at the outset had these party circles uh, that were very much styled after the assemblies of the Indignados, right? Quinceme protest movement. But then there was a debate internally on organization, and partly was precisely the trauma of uh, the assemblies, right? And the trauma of Occupy Wall Street. I think in the US, many people have experienced the same trauma, namely being through assemblies that were (laughs) dysfunctional, (laughs) that were very nice at the beginning because they were a sort of moment of collective self-confession where people were really opening their hearts and basically confessing, yes, I'm a loser, and so are you, right? Really uh, something that had a sort of almost therapeutic element. But then as they continued, uh, the problem of cranks, the problem of people that couldn't kind of, uh, that were extremely disruptive became more and more prominent. So I think part of the resistance there of turning these circles into a more structured and permanent form led instead to really minimize uh, the element of local democracy. But this was the party detriment because uh, Podemos and the Five Star Movement similarly have a very significant problem 
in uh, performing well in local elections. Why is that? Precisely because local elections is where you see the strength of the party rootedness in, in local reality, right? If a party doesn't have a capillary organization at, at local level, it is not able to select cadres, it is not able to select prospective candidates, it is not able to mobilize people in order to elect them. Uh, so there is where you see the um, negative uh, effects of this distrust of organization. And the majority of people actually don't want to spend endless hours on these platforms on endless deliberation, just like everyone went insane in Occupy Wall Street assemblies. Because like the biggest problem for advocates of this kind of extreme participatory and direct democracy is that it's premise that there's a demand for Partici- for endless participation is just not true. Completely. I, I really believe that there is this illusion that people are very eager to participate. There is really a illusion that I think is class specific. It is precisely these new middle class, these social cultural professionals, that because they are frustrated in the workplace, that they are basically told what to do and have to cope with decisions made by managers also, they feel, in a way, disenfranchised in a society in which the space for democracy has been shrinking and shrinking. And they believe that somehow this wish of, uh, of theirs is something common in society. While it is not. I mean, it is not because uh, uh, normal people, say the average U.S. citizen or the average European citizen, uh, if he, she has a free weekend, the ideal thing to do is holidays, right? Is not participating in a, a weekend long assembly, debating uh, very obscure uh, points or motions. Uh, so there is this apocryphal quote from Oscar Wilde, uh, according to which socialism is good, but uh, it wastes too many Wednesday nights. And, and I think it is, that is true for many people. I mean, many people don't want to do that. And Mickles talked about organizational life being dominated by, quote, the, the habitués of meetings. <laughs> completely, completely. <laughs> and like the, free, the freaks who love meetings, whereas, you, whereas I think most people would be, want to be involved in politics, but would rather spend their weekend, say, canvassing. Yes. And this is exactly. something that's good about Bernie's distributed organizing mm-hmm. model, canvassing than in a weekend long meeting. Yes, yes, because it's more practical. People want to, uh, many people want to be involved in practical things that uh, involve action, right? Rather than, than that feel efficacious. And, and also, I think there is also a generational question. I've been noticing that in the left a lot, both in, uh, in the UK and in Italy and Spain, uh, where uh, young people, also people that are young and politicized coming from social movements really have an allergy for long meetings and for people speaking too long in meetings, which is not the case, for example, with older generations and older activists where they are more used to people speaking long time. And uh, in Spain, they refer to this problem as, uh, uh, th- that's where I, I'm going to say a bad word for <laughs> fir- first and, uh, and last time, the uh, iron asses democracy, they call it. <laughs> uh, namely, a, a democracy where uh, the people, you know, you need to have a, a metal, metallic bottom in order to withstand hours and hours <laughs> of conversations going on. Actually, I mean, sometimes actually assemblies become that because there is an interest that they are boring and, and, and uh, frustrating. So that at some point, people who are not part of the inner circle go away and the people who remain make the decisions. Uh, for example, in the Labour Party, there was a lot of debate when there was this surge in members, right, uh, with Jeremy Corbyn. and was a spectacular surge in members. I mean, it went from uh, 180,000 uh, in 2007 when Blair left to three times that figure in 2017, 2018. And there were many older Labour militants who were complaining. So where are all these people, right? I mean, okay, CLM- CLPs local uh, Labour Party committee meetings were far more crowded than they had been in the past, but then not as much as one would have expected in many circumstances. 
And the reason is that for many young people, they are afraid that meetings are going to be these boring and gray and frustrating things where people fight, right, all the time. And we no actual result, right, with no actual action. Yet even with younger generations today, there is a version of the minority habit- of Mikkel's habitues of of meetings, people who have endless time to debate on Twitter or Slack or these platforms that you discuss. And these people often have less interest in doing the boring drudgery of organizing work. But then the people who want to do do that practical work get scared away by the endless deliberations and, and debates. Yes, there is a sort of aristocratic tendency in participation. Right? So participation far from uh, leading to more equality, which in a way is the assumption made by uh, techno-utopians, right? That the participatory society would uh, erode uh, the um, dominant position of large organizations and, and whatever powerful individuals. Instead, it can lead to uh, more inequality because of the Jacob Nielsen law of participation inequality. Is this law according to which there is a split, a one nine ninety split in all online communities, right? Think about Wikipedia. Uh, very, very few people, less than 1% have ever written anything on Wikipedia or edited anything on Wikipedia. The great, great majority of people are just passive consumers. That's me. But this, <laughs> me too, me too. And I, and I love Wikipedia and it's been so useful for so many things, but I never actually had the spirit of initiative to do, to do anything. But that's more generally our condition. I say, is it something about the human condition that is also think about social media. 90% of the time we are watching other people doing things, right? We are reading, we are scrolling, we are watching. And it's only 10% at most, when we actually say something, right? So this power law can end up giving inordinate amount of power to people who may well not be representative of the general will of a given community. Let's talk about the hyperleader. You write, quote, the hyperleader is a plebiscitary charismatic figure tasked with representing the party in the media and internet spectacle by attending TV talk shows and intervening obsessively on social media. Through his histrionic performances, the hyper leader makes up for the lack of a strong and dependable organization. And then, quote, his image, celebrated in thousands of memes, serious or joking, his name being repeated incessantly in social media exchanges and turned into hashtags, all of which becomes a sort of symbolic rallying point for digital militancy. And you write that the hyperleader, in fact, was an intentional model for leadership developed by Podemos. Not that it wouldn't have come to, into existence anyways, but Podemos specifically founders, Podemos's founders specifically theorized this. What, what did Podemos's founders want to accomplish with the hyperleader and how has that turned out in Spain and elsewhere? Yeah, actually, as I came to realize recently, uh, after finishing the book, actually, the origin of the term, or say the popularization of the term within Podemos uh, was uh, f- coming from uh, Juan Carlos Monedero, uh, one of the founding uh, uh, figures of Podemos. And he was using that in reference to Hugo Chavez. You use that the term to refer in the, to the way in which Chavez was this towering figure, having these like hours and hours long uh, TV uh, programs, right, where he would uh, really uh, speak directly with the people of his country and discuss any issue, perhaps uh, and sing, break a dance, sing, uh, yeah. and everything, <laughs> right? This kind of totalizing figure. Uh, that did not discuss only uh, political things. And and, and if you look at Maduro, uh, uh, very frequent TV shows, he's still doing exactly the same. So the idea... But but much less talented. (laughs) Yes, yes, though it's getting better. So in a way, it's the idea 
of the leader not just as a political figure, but also as a cultural figure. I mean, this is a key insight also in the so-called Breitbart doctrine, right? This Gramscian insight that in order to win the political battle, you need to win the cultural battle first. And in contemporary times, in a contemporary society, in a post-traditional secular society where it, there is a sort of symbolic void at the heart of society, the political leader has a, resp- has a ritual responsibility in a way in creating a sense of unity and community and identity and creating an affective link between him, herself, and uh, the constituencies that they want to represent. Uh, I think this is a really important insight that is so relevant. I mean, you, you look at Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and that's, that is what she's doing, right? When she's on Twitch playing video games, right? You may think, I mean, what, what the hell is she doing? I mean, this is not what a politician is supposed to do. But a hyper leader is supposed to do that. A hyper leader is supposed to connect with gamers using the things gamers do, right? Playing video games. Uh, she's supposed to connect with ordinary people by cooking, right? While speaking to the camera. This is, is I think, is really important now, this ability, this sim- symbolic performative ability for the success of contemporary leaders. That isn't to say that leadership is bad, though, you emphasize. Well, why structurally and psychologically is leadership indispensable? And and what does the myth that we can do without leaders obscure about grappling with the serious question of what kind of leadership we need? I think we need to be far more merciful towards leaders than we have used to be. I mean, we need to be cautious of leaders, obviously. We need to uh, condemn leaders when necessary. But we need to realize that being a leader may sound nice, but no normal person would do it for more than a day. There are only certain people with certain psychological conditions and certain talent who can actually tolerate the pressure that kind of position puts you into. You know, there is some beautiful description in in Freud, Totem and and Taboo, where he talks about kings who were uh, escaping from their responsibility as kings because they couldn't suffer spending the entire day on the throne so that the court and the people could see them without being allowed to shake or move, lest their movement uh, uh, <laughs> lead to an earthquake. Because there was this perception that the body of the leader was a sort of representation of the state of the country. And similar pressures are uh, present in contemporary politics. Being a leader means being constantly visible, means being constantly scrutinized, means Mm, not having a private life at all, right? Again, think about AOC or think about other members of the squad. Think about, uh, I mean, Bernie Sanders. Uh, I mean, think about, mm, especially you know, younger leaders, the kind of pressure they're under are huge and they are, though, they are human beings. So with their own flows, we, they can make mistakes. And, but what needs to be realized is that they are a huge resource, uh, we cannot do without uh, them because there is a human necessity to identify oneself with something and especially with other human beings, right? Being human beings, we tend very easily to identify with other human beings. Uh, so <laughs> I'd say I, I, I would advocate more, more mercy uh, towards leaders uh, because it is a very important and delicate role for for the success of of left campaigns, the presence of effective uh, and motivated leaders. Yeah, you write, quote, the leader thereby becomes a point of projection at which the desire for identification of the mass coalesces. And that's certainly been true for Bernie, who's sort of anti-charisma, signaled authenticity, which then became charisma, this constancy that allowed for the left to gain coherence in the U.S. that we did not otherwise have given our state of disorganization. And it's something that we're still seeing just recently with his with his recent meme blow up. 
people literally invest a lot in the image, the very image and personality of, of Bernie Sanders. Completely. The, there is this sort of ironic, I say, turning upside down of, of, of charisma, this uh, tendency also to revalue aesthetics that may not correspond to the normal canon, right? So, say of, of beauty or, or, uh, or excellence in other ways. If you think about TikTok, right? I mean, where people sometimes are prized for doing things that, or for not looking exactly as beautiful as people look on, on Instagram, say. So, yeah, and charisma is something strange, right? Charisma sometimes can be found in places where one would not expect that to be found. And it is not a property of the subject. It is not a property of the leader. It is more of uh, uh, an element that is recognized by the followers in the leader. So it is, in a way, something that stands in between, as it were, uh, something elusive, almost like a spirit standing in between uh, the, the followers and the leaders. What is really interesting for me is why politics is becoming so personalized uh, again. Uh, and uh, because this contradicts the predictions of Antonio Gramsci, right? When he was talking about the modern prince, what he said was that in our day and age, in our modern society, in our industrial society, a leader, a personal leader like the condottiere, of the Renaissance armies in Italy could not anymore embody a collective purpose. You needed an organization. You needed a machine of many men and women in order to organize collective will. But now it is as if, again, the condottiere is, is making a comeback. As if, once again, uh, people need personalized leadership uh, to identify with something. And let's talk about the bad side of this, because that's certainly a big part of your book. The digital party model you write, quote, allows them to achieve impressive feats at times of enthusiasm and mobilization. Yet, it also raises serious problems of sustainability at times of demobilization, when euphoria risks turning into dysphoria, and the hope of change all too frequently gives way to disappointment. You continue, quote, the key strategic question is whether the charisma of the leader is eventually routinized in a more stable organizational structure that is not completely wed to the leader's ebbs and flows. The risk, evidently, is that if this does not take place, the party will end up perishing once the leader's charisma starts becoming opaque and when the love of the super base for its spokesperson turns into suspicion and resentment. The ever-present danger is for the hyperleader to consume himself in a flame of boundless enthusiasm and hope that has, as their necessary counterparts, moments of depression and despair. This really resonated with me and was what like kind of led me to finding your book <laughs> in the first place. Um, you, you Google that. Th this all. <laughs> yeah, I was like, <laughs> moments of depression and despair. <laughs> For the left. Yeah, I mean, uh, search. Uh, but, but yeah, it, sorry, please. Oh, yeah. It, it all really emerged powerfully in the wake of, of Bernie's loss last year, where there was no institutionalization of the campaign as a permanent organization, which I do hold Bernie responsible for, frankly. And then among some of his supporters, this turned to bitterness and intense suspicion, which we really saw explode a few few weeks ago when a YouTube comedian named Jimmy Dore, who I had never heard of, but apparently has many followers, rallied this incohate internet base against AOC in a fight that was purportedly about winning Medicare for all, but that precisely because it was strategically bankrupt and doomed to failure was really fundamentally and inevitably about deep frustration and pessimism fueling the demonization of AOC and the squad as being what's actually standing between us and Medicare for all, people like her selling us out. Is it fair to say that that this kind of minor hyper leader like Dor is in a way a funhouse mere consequence of the weakness of the Bernie and AOC hyper leader model that that ironically AOC's reliance on this very form of charismatic hyper leadership left her vulnerable to an attack on her authenticity and the credit thus the credibility of her leadership an attack that gained its power through the very same sort of social media 
celebrity framework? Yes, I think that in a way the hyper leader is a sort of a symptomatic ailment, right? Uh, that tries to address the real problem in our society in and the real challenge for organization, which is the enormous distrust of people in politicians. I mean, a distrust that is far too well motivated. People have, uh, for years and years, witnessed politicians that say one thing and one other thing. They feel betrayed by the political class. And this is the source of contemporary anti-elitism. And I think as all things are rational, all that is real is rational. And this anti-elitism exists these days because there has been a betrayal of the elites, of part of the elites uh, uh, towards the people. So in a way, what the hyperleader does is trying to reassure people that, hey, he, she is just a fellow human being, just like you. That's why AOC is cooking pasta. That's why Salvini is picturing himself having breakfast, so that Italians know almost uh, perfectly the number of calories he is ingesting every day. <laughs> uh, that's why uh, you see also figures such as uh, Jimmy Dore emerging, right? People, f- figures that people trust for whatever reason, because they have, they're familiar with them, or, or why Donald Trump made it in the first place, right? Because the people had seen him on The Apprentice for all those years. And therefore, he was like a familiar figure, a, an household name, like someone like, yes, Donald Trump. I mean, he's crazy, but I know who he is, right? So it's something that reassures people. The problem there, though, is indeed that you become over-reliant on the leader. And, and, and the leader's charisma at some point can dissipate, especially as a consequence of overexposure. It's in the time of Netflix when we get tired about series after whatever. After the first season, things age so quickly. You see that many people who really touch their peak of popularity then can only go down. And the real challenge for us is building organization and ideology uh, and a kind of common framework, common ideas, common values, a sense of community that while encompassing the performance of leaders and leaders will always be there, is not over dependent on them, right? That is actually able to build a community that leaders are the representative and uh, uh, the projection of, rather than being the pillar that these communities sit on. This is really challenging because also the millennial generation and the generation Z partly indeed have a certain anti-organizational suspicion, which is a sort of uh, ideological luggage from the neoliberal era, uh, but only really addressing that, um, overcoming the kind of nihilism, that nihilist suspicion of organization we may, can make, a, um, can move beyond the current state of affairs. An- another problem with the hyperleader, aside from their concentrated power that you write about, is that hidden behind the hyperleader, there is often an actual strategist and decision maker who is not the hyperleader. It's not the media personality considered to be the leader by the base. In Five Star's case, behind the comedian Beppe Grillo, another comedian here like Jimmy Dore, I'm detecting a theme, stood this man named Gian Roberto Casaleggio, who, and then after his death, his son, Davide Casaleggio, who head up this private firm called Casaleggio Associati. What is going on with actual governance in Five Star? Yes, indeed. Uh, with hyper leadership, there is this illusion of transparency, right? With this, this illusion of this intermediation, this illusion of directness, uh, but always there is always something behind the throne. I mean, the famous power behind the throne figure, right? The Grand Commis, the Richelieu, the Spin Doctor. In the case of the First Movement, this firm, uh, Casaleggio Sociati, played a very important role in uh, creating the conditions for. Uh, the success, the explosion of the Five Star Movement and managing, and he continues to manage its, its communication and its platform. He was basically the actor that allowed Beppe Grillo to translate his celebrity status and his ability as a performer in uh, theaters around Italy into the status of web celebrity, right? At some point, the Observer, I think, 
put Grillo in the top 10 of uh, bloggers worldwide because his blog was widely <laughs> popular, right? It was a time when blogs were still a thing, right? <laughs> Back in the days. And I think if you look at the, the Five Star Movement ideology really stems from this golden era of blogs in, in a way. Uh, because it was the mid noughties when these, uh, these, these uh, political rise took place. But then many people started questioning the role of Casaleggio, right? Because it surfaced that Casaleggio was also curating the communication of other politicians. It uh, surfaced that it didn't just have a technical role, but a political role, right? That they were deciding things that were about policies. They were uh, selecting candidates, uh, they were um, focusing on people that were considered as strain away from the party position. Uh, they've been accused of uh, creating a, a data set of, of members that was very with very low security standards. And actually, the party database was hacked multiple times. A hacker put it on sale for one Bitcoin, which was around $3,000 at a time. Now it would be much more expensive. And actually, more recently, there was a big clash as the Five Star Movement is go undergoing internal reform, precisely because some of the problems that we have discussed, they also came to realize that these problems are true, and is actually adopting a more structured form. And actually, Davide Casaleggio, who has basically physical control of the database, uh, threatened that he would... Uh, uh, relinquish its uh, collaboration with the Five Star Movement and make the platform available to other parties. And even posted on the official party blog without authorization, right? <laughs> Which really shows the perversity of certain ideological uh, illusions about the, the, the overcoming of leadership. Because then leadership and power, if you want to sweep them under the carpet, at some point they come from under the carpet and often in ways that are more nefarious than normal power and leadership would be. There's another very interesting case of this dynamic of the power behind the power with Podemos that culminated in this huge fight between Inigo Erejon, the, the key strategist behind Podemos, and the face of Podemos. Pablo Iglesias, who becomes this enormous figure coming out of the Indignados, Indignados movement through his internet TV program called La Tuerca, which then launches him into mainstream TV debates and becomes he becomes this hyper leader, but behind him is Inigo Erejon. But then the two come into to conflict and Iglesias won. It's like a Chad and Virgin dualism. You know, the, the famous meme. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, yeah, because I'm saying that because it's a common trend across many of these movements, right? Often you have this uh, nerd figure standing behind the visible Chad, <laughs> right? The, the visible uh, extrovert guy who is this histrionic actor. So you have Beppe Grillo, right, who is this crazy guy who is gesticulating even more than an average Italian would do and sweating and, and screaming and everything. And then behind him there was this Gian Roberto Casaleggio who looks like uh, an IT guy, right, uh, a person who is very cold-blooded and reserved and introverted. Same with Salvini uh, in Italy. Then you have behind another guy who has similar mm, human qualities. And, and, and in Spain, similarly, that was the case with uh, Iglesias and Rejon. Iglesias became the leader of Podemos almost by chance because Rejon and other early founders, I mean, the early group that basically led to the foundation of Podemos were uh, uh, went on a sort of talent scouting uh, <laughs> campaign, right? And they were thinking about different people who could, they had these hypotheses, they had, they had precisely these hyper-leader hypotheses. And they were thinking uh, in the aftermath of the Indignados movement, when there was this sort of phase of reflux of the movement, who could have been the person? Actually, according to Herman Cano, a philosopher who was in the founding group, in this founding group, and one of the founders of Podemos, the first choice was Ada Colau, 
right? The mayor of Barcelona, who was at the time far more famous than uh, Iglesias. Because she had just given this steering speech at uh, the uh, Spanish Congress where she had denounced the uh, uh, the problem of, of homelessness, uh, people being kicked out of their homes, right? She had much- And, banker, and, she, and she really went after bankers, right? Exactly. In that hearing, yeah. She had a very significant celebrity status back then. Pablo Iglesias had relative celebrity status, though much smaller than the one of Ada Colau, because he had uh, become frequent guest on talk shows, on political talk shows in on Spanish TV, after this alternative TV channel, TV program called La Tuerca, self-produced by a small group of people. So ultimately, they, they picked him because he was really good at TV debates, right? He was really good at talk shows. He could speak very fast and express things in a very direct and articulate manner after shaming older politicians uh, from conservative parties who instead couldn't really speak properly on, on public television. But in a way, the real brain of Podemos, in a sense, the person who came up with the, the philosophy of uh, political discourse, the, the idea of left populism, right, uh, drawn from Laclau and Mouffe, uh, was Eric Hon, who also was the person who actually created the basic organizational structure of the party. Because at the time, uh, uh, very soon, Iglesia was elected to the European Parliament alongside other uh, candidates from Podemos, after the uh, the May 2014 elections, where they had this surprise result. Therefore, being elected in, in the European Parliament meant that Iglesias was, uh, uh, a lot of time was in Brussels. And therefore, he couldn't uh, uh, realistically create the party organization in Madrid. Uh, Errejón was the person who actually went about creating, right, the different structures, actually, uh, selecting the people who would form the party structure and so on and so forth. So at some point there was this uh, internal conflict in the party because also Iglesias distrusted the very kind of party bureaucrats that uh, Eric Hon had selected, which was indeed, I mean, a quite sorry uh, split, as I think all political splits are. Yeah, it basically ended with uh, Eric Hon founding an alternative party uh, party called Mas País, More Country, though in, in English doesn't sound uh, <laughs> as good as in Spanish, <laughs> which was not ultimately very successful. It ended up being a sort of uh, middle-class ecological party, uh, and it, it just managed to elect four MPs in, uh, in the Spanish Congress. Th this isn't the only fight that Podemos leader Pablo Iglesias won that's super revealing about the dynamics of hyper-leadership. Another involved Iglesias and Podemos' party speaker in Congress, Iglesias' partner, Irine Montero, who they purchased a fancy suburban home, emblematic of the very sort of disconnected elite class that opposition to and derision towards was, you know, fundamental to the indignados and to Podemos. How did... Iglesias' hyperleader credibility create the this vulnerability in I think what was called Chalet Gate. And how did he then use his position as hyperleader and the power of plebiscitarianism to, to resolve it? Yes, there was a very interesting case. It was the time when uh, Iglesias' leadership uh, was shaking the most because there was an internal referendum within Podemos, and 30% of Podemos, of participants, voted for Iglesias and Montero to resign, right? This is significant because most of these online internal referendums within parties have overwhelming results in favor of the leadership. It's very rare that you see percentages going below 85% or so. There are super majorities usually kind of confirming what the leaders want anyway. And in this case, it really showed the risks of uh, excessive focus on, on the leader, as well as the risks uh, of uh, populist moralism, we could call it. Namely, the fact that if uh, a key component of your discourse is criticizing people's behavior uh, rather than structural factors, ultimately, it, the, the time when you 
uh, happen to perform a type of behavior that is can be seen as similar to the one you have criticized, you come under redoubled criticism as a hypocrite, right? And po- perhaps uh, hypocrisy is one of the most detested scenes in our society that is so obsessed with authenticity. If you say one thing and behave another way, uh, you can be made to look very bad. Though, obviously, I mean, I don't think there is necessarily anything bad in the fact that if uh, a couple has that money, uh, which is not even a kind of extraordinary, I mean, it's 400,000, is significant money, but say we're not talking about millions and millions, uh, in and of itself, there's nothing necessarily wrong about what they did, nor there was anything illegal. But and it's not necessarily more expensive than an apartment in Lava Pies today. No, I think apartments in Lava Pies are far <laughs> more uh, are far cheaper <laughs> than that chalet. I think that chalet actually was more than four hundred thousand. I think it was more like eight hundred thousand. So it, it was something that only say upper middle class Spanish people could afford, and also the implication uh, say of going out of the city in a secluded location, right? For Especially for someone like Iglesias, there was uh, um, originally living in Vallecas, right? The proper working class neighborhood of Madrid. Therefore, he had the proper street cred, right? Of someone who comes from a working class neighborhood and therefore knows how hard it is for uh, for people to live in that condition. So, I mean, w- w- what it showed was how hyper-leader, hyper-leadership can short circuit. Right, uh, and and you can anticipate. I mean, similar things happening perhaps in the future with AOC. I mean, or or this Jimmy Dore thing you were referring to, right? Uh, when someone invests so much in persuading people that they are morally upright, which is true. I mean, in the case of many of these people, I mean, sometimes it takes a very little scene or very little incoherence, right? Because in that case, for example, it was a procedural thing, right? This Jimmy Dore criticism, the fact that he was asking them to vote against Nancy Pelosi because uh, uh, that was the only way Medicare could be implemented, right? I mean, these small faults can lead to the entire edifice, in a way, of the hyperleader to crack. You argue for a relational approach that recognizes that hierarchy and leadership are basic requirements of organization. And so, quote, the degree of democracy depends on the balance of forces between the leadership and the membership and the degree of responsiveness of the former to the latter. In other words, it's false that we can transcend these tensions and dilemmas. They're fundamental, foundational. They can never be entirely resolved, so we have to acknowledge and manage them. Power is always delegated. The question is what powers and how and to who. But if political forms are so determined by technology, communication, and mode of production, are we simply in a new iron cage stuck with within this iron law of participationism and the fantasy of disintermediation and the rule of hyper leaders and the reactive passivity of the mass space, or is there a way out? I think that there are some human dilemmas that uh, will never be uh, entirely solved. And uh, one of them is the asymmetry of power. The power is partly always uh, uh, unequally distributed. Obviously, this doesn't mean that one should justify that, there was ultimately the conclusion that some elite theorists, think, uh, theories such as Pareto, Mosca, came to, and that was used to justify fascism as well, right? But in a way, some acceptance of, of that, some critical acceptance of the fact that power is will always be, in a way, centralized in a certain position, and that there will always be people who have leadership, and, and there will always be some form of hierarchy. I think is a good antidote to a certain absolutism uh, that then ends up generating uh, often greater monsters than the ones it wants uh, to eliminate. And again, the case of Michels, right, going from a criticism of mass parties to embrace fascism is again uh, a demonstration 
of that. So the question is what, what has to be done with organizations, I think one has to proceed from a standpoint of unblinking realism. And instead of thinking that power should be eliminated, the question is how can power be controlled from below? How can power be not only monitored, but how can we put pressure on power? How can people be represented uh, and not only how people can participate, because as we have said, sometimes participation turns into a form of power concentration in its own right, it turns into an aristocracy of participation. One antidote to that is going back to mass participation, really creating structures whose fundamental measure of success is how many people they manage to mobilize. Uh, because that's ultimately a measure of how representative of society they are. And uh, some of these parties point to the fact that the long decline in political participation uh, may soon be overcome. Uh, because again, like for example, the, the rise in membership of the, of the Labour Party or the rise of these digital parties and the fact that they have accrued a very large mem membership in a short time is an indication of that, but there's still so much ground, so, so, such a long road to be covered in order to move closer to an organizational democracy. Uh, I think that that is really the main guarantee that organizations will be democratic is the fact that they enlist as members as many people as possible. And not only be more democratic, but powerful enough to win, because as you referred to earlier, and as you wrote, quote, a fundamental assumption is that the centrality of the media system is the decisive battlefield in the struggle for power. According to this theory, hegemony is won not on the barricades of social movements, nor in the painstaking work of setting up a political movement, but rather through presence in TV studios and on social media platforms. And that emphasis on media really exposes some fundamental limits to the Bernie campaign, not that we're so much the Bernie campaign's fault, but revealing of this broader prevailing dynamic, which is that, as Gabe Winant noted in our recent interview, the social formations on the ground just weren't strong enough and wide enough and connected enough for the message, for Bernie's message, to resonate as widely as we needed it to. And so here we are, we're winning the meme, the meme war still, but Biden is president. Yes, I think that was taken mostly from, from the experience of Podemos and, and Pablo Iglesias who also wrote uh, about these issues. And I think what uh, Iglesias, the point Iglesias was making there was that the left often has this very lofty and noble idea, right, of, of the struggle or the physical struggle of the struggle street by street, of uh, rootedness in the neighborhoods uh, and in the workplace. And that obviously it is important, it was important, and it will be important. But we need to realize at the same time that in this uh, incredibly mediatized society, the media are a key power center. I mean, actually, Iglesias realized it as an Erasmus student in Italy uh, during Berlusconi's uh, <laughs> <laughs> period in power. And I was an Italian during that period, and I, I think many, many of us realized that, how powerful is TV, how powerful it is. With Berlusconi, it was more evident, right, because it was so blatant. He rebuilt his entire political venture on the fact that he literally controlled the media. He owned them, right? And this is... Incredibly true. I mean, this again is a Gramscian insight and the Breitbart doctrine that I previously referred to, as it was uh, explained by Chris Christopher Wiley, this person who worked for Cambridge Analytica, is also based precisely on this, that the cultural battle, but not in the sense of culture war of identity politics, in a sense, the battle for consensus, let's call it, is the condition for political victory. You cannot hope to win elections, you cannot hope to win power unless you first win the hearts and minds of people in a very hostile environment for the left, right? Because we know that the media are biased against us, uh, social media are biased against us. Uh, nonetheless, 
it is where you lose or win the fight. It is the, not the only place, obviously, but it is the decisive place where you lose or win the fight. Uh, unless you do that, all the other battles uh, are going to be useless. And I think that this insight should stay with us still because it remains true. And investing in the symbolic conflict, investing in, in media, in messaging, and in our content is fundamental if you want to persuade people and win them over. Well, Paolo Garbalo, thank you very much. You're welcome, Daniel. Thanks very much for hosting me. Paolo Garbalo is a sociologist and political theorist working at King's College London. He's the author of The Digital Party, Political Organization and Online Democracy, and of The Great Recoil, Politics After Populism and Pandemic, forthcoming from Verso. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that numbers weigh in the balance only if united by combination and led by knowledge. While other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis. Music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinator is Izzy Olive. Our senior advisor is Thea Rio Francos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Every interview organized by subject and guest. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio and please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. If it's on iTunes, you can also leave us a lovely, glowing review. Those reviews help introduce us to new listeners. But what really does that is you telling other people why they should listen to the show. People like your friends, family, whatever. Please make propaganda for us and please do find us at patreon.com and make a monthly contribution to help keep this operation up and running strong. Even a few bucks is huge.